This is The Role of Death in Life, The Worm at the Core, very nice book by Sheldon Solomon and Jeff Greenberg uh, and other co-authors. And it talks about existential death anxiety. And it's all there with us all the time. And so you guys have all just changed because I've made you more fearful of your own death. And of course, there's loads of it now. We forget, in fact, usually about the importance of existential death anxiety and how it can change our behavior. Again, follows Nasty on after Martin's talk. And this is just one simple experiment, but look at its power. Two groups were formed and selected by a questionnaire to be the same in personality. And they were all judges, judges. One half were given just the questionnaire. The other had an additional question. How long? do you think you will live? Both groups were asked to judge a minor crime, a prostitute found working the streets. Now, the average fine for that crime at the time was 50 pounds, that was the baseline. In the first group, where the judges were not asked to think about their mortality, they set an average fine of 50 pounds, which is what you would expect. But the group who had been asked about their mortality first, set, a, set a, a fine that was nine times higher. And what's amazing are two things. One is that judges are supposedly trained to administer the law evenly and rationally. And secondly, when the experiment was explained to them, the second group all said, no way your stupid little questionnaire could have had any effect on my behavior. So it's really very important and I'm sorry that I affected your behavior so well, so well, and it's still go on for a little time, in fact, until, until it wears off. And if you go to court, for heaven's sake, don't mention death. Whenever people are reminded of death, they love people who share their beliefs. They hate people who are different. They sit closer to people who share their beliefs. They sit further away from anyone who looks different. And if we give such people in a laboratory setting an opportunity to physically harm someone who's different, they become much more hostile and vicious. Now think about that. There's a lot of death about. And uh, in those societies, they choose charismatic leaders well. And uh, can you see any of these things in the present problems we have with the COVID uh, pandemic? Is there a way around this? Well, yes, there is. I, I don't know if any of you have been to Bhutan, but if you have, um, the Bhutanese don't hide death. And images of death are everywhere, especially in Buddhist iconography, where you'll find colorful, gruesome illustrations. No one, not even children, are sheltered from these images or the ritual dances reenacting death. Now, that's actually very good because you lose your existential fear to some extent. Five reminders a day are thought necessary for your happiness. And there's an app you can get. It's called We Croak. And this will give you five reminders of death a day. And um, you will then uh, be able to overcome your fear of death because it will be brought up for you all the time. Hansa Bergwell has written a book, We Croak, a handbook for being temporary. Well, does it really matter all that much? Well, in actual fact, it does because it affects our whole behavior. Does ignoring death have consequences? The Dalai Lama says yes. Those who reject death suffer from a false sense of permanence. Any of you guys suffering from a false sense of permanence? You become more greedy, more self-serving and lustful, have more energies, become more attached to my wealth, my health, my friends, my enemies, and my family. So you can think about that. Uh, we are attached to life. In our culture, we fear death and shut it out by not discussing it. How many of you have gone to a cocktail party recently or any party and said, I think I'll be buried just two miles from here. We don't say that sort of thing. We still do not understand that just started to study the subjective processes of dying, and they're very important. There are very few studies on phenomena surrounding the time of death, but 
they're getting more and more, and it's really good, so we need to look those up. There is uncertainty about whether such phenomena are spiritual or organic in origin, but does it matter? Many carers feel they lack the training in how to respond when told about these phenomena. Okay, well, that's enough about existential fear of death. Um, what is the evidence for consciousness after death? In other words, when you die, guys, is your consciousness going to go on or not? So let's just have a look at that. And I'm going to suggest to you that a new era has begun. And there it is. And what is that? That is Mr. Bigelow's uh, spacecraft. And uh, he is interested in space, obviously, uh, visitors from outer space. And also, it looks as if he's more interested in inner space, too, because he very kindly um, gave a, a, gave a question to the world um, what happens to consciousness after bodily death and this is only has just come out in the last two weeks so some of you may not know about it others of you of course will and uh, you had to write an essay of 27,000 words couldn't be religious uh, had to be uh, dealing with science and uh, if you won, you'd get half a million dollars. Well, many of us will work quite hard for half a million dollars. And indeed, over a thousand people applied. But he didn't want that. Uh, just strange people applying, because that's a lot of work for the judges. So he took and allowed the only people to apply who were working in the field, essentially. So just over 200 essays were submitted and 200, uh, 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 they were in fact 204 that were judged and 5% won prizes. So here are your winners, Jeffrey Mishlove, known to many of you, uh, Thinking Aloud and now New Thinking Aloud. He got the uh, half million dollars. Then Pim Van Lommel, his was on Consciousness, very nice essay, I like it, a quarter of a million. Leo Rubicki from, uh, uh, from the England uh, Psychical Society got 100. Then there were 11 essays that were given 50,000 each, and 15 essays got an honourable mention, and 20,000. So that's 5% being winners. And we were in the uh, honorable mentions. There is the, the uh, URL, so you can read all these essays. And I'd recommend that you certainly read the first three. We put cartoons in ours because we didn't want to make it too heavy. They want to testify to the court about afterlife, was one of our opening ones. And this uh, one I, here I take from uh, um, the winning essay. And he just labels all the things which are now secure. Physical mediumship, near-death experiences, after-death communication, reincarnation, peak in Darian experiences has two or three meanings. It's usually, in fact, those people who uh, say they are dying and they have a vision of somebody who isn't dead, very unusual, and um, then they find out that they are were in fact dead. The possession states, instrumental transcommunication, do you remember this is the snow uh, in videos or the noise in radios coming out as words, Zenoglossky and mental mediumship, all these now look as if they do, in fact, have truth behind them. Uh, this is the third one. He was talking a lot about mediums. And the conclusion really is that we now have to take the old work on mediums, as well as the new work, obviously, on seances and ghosts seriously. 
So here's the sort of thing that we have to take seriously. It's a ghost story. They were coming out of the wall. 18-year-old plumber's apprentice, Harry Martindale, was in the cellars of the Treasurer's House, an historic house in York, UK, working on the central heating system when he heard the distant blaring of a note in his words. Perched up a ladder, Martindale continued his work as the sound grew louder. Then looking down, he saw a figure wearing a plumed helmet and holding a trumpet-like instrument come through the wall, followed by um, uh, a horse and rider and a column of Roman soldiers. Martindale fell off his ladder with fright and watched about 20 sailors, sailors, mar uh, soldiers marched across the cellar. Now, th these sorts of stories, which you think in terms of distortion of the human mind, uh, people making them up and so on, probably do are much more firmly fixed in our reality. And we really now need to start taking those into account. Reincarnation was one of them. I like this, con this um, cartoon. Brutus, it's you again. Um, the data on reincarnation is fantastic. So we've got to, when we think about the world and who we are and how we die, we've got to think about how many of us may be coming back. So uh, another one, which is very common, is after-death communication. Uh, there you are. I'd rather talk to the Scientific American editor. And uh, after-death communication is common. It is very, very common. One meta-analysis of 35 studies published from 19, 1894 to 2005 involved 50,000 participants from 24 countries to give an estimate of 30 to 35 spontaneous incidents of after-death communications in the general population. After-death communications are people who have died speaking to you uh, touching you, you can smell their scent, and so on. With 70 to 80 percent of the bereaved having an ADC within a year of bereavement, concluding that AC ADCs are both common and normal. It is very common. And if you ask people if they get help from after death communications, many of them say they do. And the study published in 2020 estimated an incidence of 40 to 50% in the general population. And I found, uh, since quite often I talk to people who have lost their spouses, that they are very common. And in fact, they may even um, uh, feel their spouses in bed and so on. Is this just the brain making it up? No. It's much further than that. Uh, so uh, I have to stop this. Every time I come back to life, it feels like dying. Um, now, outside time, time is something which is uh, very abnormal or, or changed in NDEs. And here's one comment, a 55-year-old anesthetist anesthetist in the University of Texas Health Center, had a conventional 27-year career in medicine when he died. We didn't, of course, have a heart attack, and he had his NDE. And I, I'm using this one because he has tried to find himself still conscious, which is uh, not uncommon in NDEs, and he described being in a dimension beyond sequential time where past, present, and future all merge. And it's this question of the merging of past, present, and future, which is important. So let us talk about consciousness and uh, think if quantum mechanics suggests it's possible to live in no space, no time. Now we're, of course, coming on to our essay, which we put into the Bigelow essays. Right, we've got solutions for past, future, past, future, causality, retro causality. Now what's the problem? Now, and that is indeed exactly what the problem is. 
uh, not to be or not to be. This is the answer. Consciousness survives. And uh, this was done with Pier Francesco, Vasilios, and Martin Redfern. There is an existent reality after death, which is in no space, no time, we suggest. Brain's acts as a filter going way back to William James. And the filtered version is our lifetime reality. So let's have a think about that. Um, I'm going to do this fairly quickly. Any of you who are interested can read the essay and the URL um, uh, will be in, in, is in the slides. Uh, for example, if you take a hut or a boat, they both come from uh, wood, but they have different significance and energy. So it's nothing to do with how they're made. It is the actual concept itself. And here you have the idea of uh, monads, which occur both in time and space, and then they can function together as groups of monads, and they become interlinked as in this diagram. Now, if we take that idea further, we can talk about absolute reality. And we can talk about absolute reality being filtered by us. First of all, uh, in an objective sense, and in the subjective sense, this will be the world and this will be our mind. And this is in the noetic sense or the psychic sense. So those are our three realities. Uh, the public one, which is objective with language and action, the private one, which all the mind questions go to, and then the psychic one, uh, where there is no space and no time. And here you have things like uh, telepathy, uh, remote viewing, and all those sorts of things. And the interesting thing is that if you take this sort of model, when you come to uh, think about death, then it's the change in the probability to be localized, which means that you're more firmly held out of, or your filter is more complete, in the idea of a non-local uh, or atemporal realm. Uh, on the other hand, this collapses, to some extent, when you lose your body, and then the probability that you access no space, no time, uh, is increased enormously. So this is living, and this is death. Uh, he here is the material realm in space and time, and our probability of being there. So um, I'm going to end with a short coda, and I'm going to suggest to you uh, a man called Alan Forger, who has the ability to radiate light at will, and says he journeys into space. And what is his space? It is, in fact, uh, no space, no time. Uh, Alan Forger is a French philosopher. He has written a book, How to Get Out of This World Alive. And he came from a moneyed family, so he could be a trust fund kid spent a lot of his time meditating in cathedrals, church, Notre Dame, etc. Here's a picture of him, and I just make this as a cartoon, so that you can get the idea that when he goes into the void, he shows some of the cities, and light is seen in the room over his shirt and around him. Uncle Alan's enlightenment proved beneficial for all the family. So light phenomena, they have a long history of association with meditation, spiritual experience, and death. Um, and here is a paper in the Buddhist tradition uh, where there's a discussion on light, strings of light, goggles of light, colored jewels, light in rays spreading out, radiant light. Another one by Lindahl in 14, I was just bursting with light. I just closed my eyes and it was just brilliant light. I just felt like I was radiating, like there were rays of light coming out of me. Felt like it was just emanating from my body and my system. But that wasn't my entire retreat by any means. It was just near the end. And it looks as if one can get to this state 
where one does in fact create and radiate light. So we thought that we would uh, analyze what was going on in Alan's brain when he entered the void and radiate light, which I can certainly see. In fact, many other people can see it as well. And he, so here is a, his student, and there is Alan with his back to us. And these are um, uh, head diagrams of the EEG at different frequencies. This, these, this column here is Alan, and these are a student, because we're looking at how he influenced the student's brain. This is beta, 12 to 30 hertz. Uh, really not much difference. But when uh, Alan, you look in the uh, gamma one range and the gamma two range, his whole head is absolutely covered with gamma. And just looking at time plot, uh, rather an amplitude frequency plot, that's up to 100 hertz. The uh, gamma activity shoots up during this period. So it's certainly associated uh, the giving of light with gamma. And since entering the void, Forgey says that he's no longer afraid of death because, in fact, uh, when he stands back and enters the void, he becomes multidimensional. At times, he explores no taste, no space, and no time with his future. And it's a suggestion that this is what led death is going to be very much like for all of us. Uh, and uh, leaving here uh, and going into no space, no time. These levels correlate with another state of being which he enters and which he says has a special quality to it. He also states that his physical death, he'll permanently enter this no space, no time area, which he defines as an area into which all humans who have entered the void will go. But he insists this area has nothing to do with time and space. So the idea that it's a, a full application of quantum mechanics with the idea that time and both space are relative and don't exist there. So that those of you who are interested, uh, please read the Bigelow essays and there is the URL for it. You can actually just put Bigelow essays into Google and you'll get it. And thank you all very much for your attention. And thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you so much, Peter. That was amazing, as always. We have a couple of minutes for questions, if anyone would like to ask something, which you can either type in the chat, or actually, maybe we could look back through the chat. Um, or you can also just pop right in and ask. Let's see here. 200. All right. Any Mr. Bigelow, on? does uh, Mr. Bigelow, do you have any fear of death personally? <laughs> uh, he obviously must be very afraid of death. I haven't asked him that question, but I'd love to know. Um, because one would assume that he wouldn't ask this question in such a forceful way if it wasn't meaningful. Who's going to give away uh, $1.8 million? <laughs> so he obviously, um, yeah, he feels it's important. So do we all, incidentally. And that's why I kicked up your fear of death at the beginning of this presentation. <laughs> Someone asked if there was any pictures of him radiating light. Uh, uh, yes, I can tell you a lot about that. If you take a camera, you'll see no light radiated. If you look at him, you will see light radiated. And it's quite clearly that it is, in fact, in the dimension of mind, because we had 100 people looking at him and then uh, counted the number of people who were able to see the light and it was about a third couldn't, uh, another third uh, could, and another third very strongly. 
and this is over uh, over the internet on on FaceTime. So this is a mind type thing. You you won't find it uh, in um, in the results of knocking electrons out of cameras. Think yeah. about a minute left. Let me ask can, a I, can I ask one quick question? No, I'm going to take the reins here for just a second. Okay. Peter, I know that there's something about an exchange of information in those EEG recordings um, between the, the sort of subject that's emanating the light and uh, the other research participant. Can you say anything about that? Yes, uh, there, it looks as if uh, when he is giving light, he takes over their brains. In other words, you get changes in the frequency spectrum of the um, uh, students' brains. Uh, we've done it with three people so far, and there are clear changes which we can see. And also when we do uh, a, in a scanner an fMRI on him, we can find that certain areas in his brain light up, like the left frontal region and uh, the amygdala. All right. Anil, you want to ask your question real quick? We have less than a minute, but go for it if you'd like to. Yeah, yes. Um, I think that I love your premise, which is that the denial of death has a social consequence, though, you, which you made first, first in the beginning as a premise as well as probably a conclusion. And that was Ernest Becker's kind of book. So I was just wondering, um, how do you relate to that, that the society is very persistent in denying sort of the existence of death, uh, maybe especially the Western society, not necessarily even Eastern or Indian society. How, how do we sort of mitigate that uh, living in the Western world as we do? Uh, you mitigate it by actually teaching death to your kids <laughs> because they have loads of death around. I mean, their hamsters' heads are, are nipped off by foxes. Their grandparents are, are dying. So we, we bring it in that way. And we teach people how to die. You've got to learn how to die. And if there's anything this conference learns, that is the don't go and die without learning how to do it properly first, because you can get a very nice death if you do it that way, but you won't if you don't. So making people conscious is the answer. Thank you. 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 Th